All right. Well, it looks like we're live. Hopefully our internet will hold up this week. And uh, last couple of weeks we've been preaching and it just stopped and to start over again. So we pray that this, I believe this is probably the most important message for you and I today. Uh, we'll be talking about, you know, if we leave this world, can we leave this world with no regrets? Are there any rewards? And, uh, but I'm going to give you nine proofs of the pre-trib rapture. Um, you know, I was speaking to a man the other day and he didn't believe in, we stopped at his shop and he said he didn't believe in a rapture. And, uh, but the Bible's very clear. So I'm going to give you nine proofs that Jesus Christ will be coming back in the clouds. And we call that the rapture. The word rapture does not appear in the Bible, but it means a quick drawing away. And then uh, he's going to be bringing some people with him. And we're going to talk about that today. So I think you'll find this very interesting. You probably want to listen to it. You probably want to, hi, Brother Les, so good to see you. Uh, we are going to be talking about the nine proofs of a pre-trib rapture. And so, uh, but let's, we're going to let the Bible speak to us today. All right. So Heavenly Father, we pray that you will just bless if your word today, as it is revealed to each and every heart, and Lord, we pray for souls to be saved, lives to be changed, and you be glorified in all. So uh, let's get started today. Uh, Brother Les, we're going to start out in uh, Revelation 1, 19, then we're going to move to Revelation chapter 4. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, write these things. Now look at this. There's three, there's three words I want you to look at. Write these things which thou hast, circle that word hast, seen, and the things which are, circle the word are, and the things which shall be thereafter, circle that. Hast is talking about chapter one. It's a glimpse of the glorified Christ in eternity past, okay? And in the word are, and the things which are, which is chapters two and three, it was the church age and the present age of grace. Now, we do live in the age of grace where we can trust in Christ to save us. But that age of grace will soon be dissolved. And we'll be talking about that in the tribulation period. So he says, shall, shall be hereafter begins in chapter four, verse one. Now we're going to read all of chapter four. And that's the end of the world and eternity future. So in verse 1 of Revelation 19, the, the last word was hereafter. And, and so the third and the final section of Revelation begins right here. The church, known as the born-again believers, that means that you have you and I have trusted only in Jesus Christ to save us. And if we've trusted in Christ and asked Christ to save us, then we are known as the born again believers. And uh, we, we've held the center stage until this part of the Bible. Uh, and in fact, the word church appears 19 times in chapters two and three. But in Revelation chapter four, the church disappears. And it's not seen again until chapter 19. And chapter 4 through 19 is going to cover a period of seven years, known as the tribulation period, all right? And uh, and so the church is not seen again until chapter 19, when we find the church returning with Christ at to the earth at the Battle of Armageddon. So let's read Revelation chapter 4. I want you to grab this today. This is so important. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked and behold, now underline this, a door was opened where? In heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, look at this, come up hither. I want you to underline that phrase. He said, I will show you things which must be here. There it is hereafter. All right. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on that throne. And he that sat was to look upon like Jasper and a sardin stone. And the, uh, there was a rainbow right about the throne. Now look at this in sight, like unto an emerald. So he says, this rainbow was not multicolored. It was like a 
emerald. It was bright green and had different shades of green around the throne of God. And verse four says, and round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting. Now, what does that represent? We'll talk about that. And they were clothed in what? White raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne, there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. Now I want you to circle that word lion because we're going to go back to creation here in a moment. The first beast was like a lion. The second was like a calf. Circle the word calf. And the third beast had the face of a man. Circle the word man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So there's a there's the bird, all right? So we see the beast. We see, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the first beast was like, a, we see the lion, the animals. We see the beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face of a man, the word man. And the fourth beast like a flying eagle. Now we're going to show you what those four things really are represented uh, in the book of Genesis. And the four beasts had each of them six wings round about them. And, and they were full of eyes within. They rest not day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is. Now look at this and is to come, okay? So once again, those three things we talked about a while ago. And when the beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. And the four and 20 elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. And look at this, underline this, and cast their crowns before the throne. Now, I'm going to be telling you what each crown could be represented today, but they're going to cast their crowns before the throne. So these crowns, these rewards that you get aren't something that you're going to wear. It's something you're going to give to give glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive what? Glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now this is important. Uh, if you want to use the radio language, uh, which would say in chapter 4, verse 1, that in other words, at this point, the church goes off of the air. And the church is not seen again till the end of chapter 19. Uh, if you'll remember in chapter 4, uh, he talked about a door that was opened in heaven. And uh, it says, behold, a door was opened in heaven. And he said he heard a voice. And that voice was talking to him like a trumpet, you know, just, just blowing out to him. And, and he said, come on up hither and I will show you things. There's that word hereafter. Well, let's go ahead and move on down the road here. And I want to show you some things. This verse is a picture of the rapture of the church. And we can only imagine what this is going to be like a glorious ride, you know, and, and are you excited about maybe taking a trip from here? Like uh, it shows here in the book of Revelation that with John, a trip to heaven. Wouldn't that be amazing? And so the question is, are you watching for Jesus the Christ? Are you working for Jesus the Christ? And are you witnessing for Jesus the Christ? The rapture the great calling up, you know, uh, is the next event in God's prophetic table, timetable. And it won't be long. It can't be. All the prophecies have now been fulfilled. And there's nothing holding back the return of Jesus the Christ. It is imminent. Uh, it could only happen at any moment, at any time. And though we do not know the day nor the hour, right now we are closer to the return of Jesus Christ than any humans have ever been in the history of the world. And I want to talk to you about that. You see, he's almost at the door and he'll open it. And when he does, he will invite his children that have received him as Savior 
to go up hither and be with him forevermore. Now this talks about more. Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm just laying the foundation before we get into the nine proofs, okay? And he's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Here it is, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Here it is, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Notice that in the air, circle that. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So whenever you take certain metals like silver and gold and zinc and copper and iron and you sprinkle them all over the ground, then you take one of these giant electromagnets and you sweep it over all of these particles of metal on the ground. Some of the metals would rise to meet the magnet, but others would stay on the ground. Now the gold would stay on the ground, the silver would stay on the ground, the zinc would stay on the ground, the, uh, the copper would stay on the ground, and the bronze would stay on the ground, but the iron would rise. So why would the iron rise? Here it is. Because it is the same nature as the magnet. So when Jesus comes again, uh, those who are heaven born and uh, will be heaven bound. Let me say it again. Those who are heaven born will be heaven bound. And those who have the nature of Jesus Christ, like the iron had with the magnet, but he says that we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. So in other words, we're going to be drawn up, just like that magnet did to the iron, but Christ is going to draw us up. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive remain. will be called up with them in the air. So the, a lot of people will scoff and laugh about the rapture, but just as, in, as they did in Noah's day, but no one will be laughing on the day when millions and millions and millions, including young children and moms and dads and grandpas, will suddenly vanish, and only those that were in the ark in Noah's day uh, uh, survived. The rest of them, children, teenagers, moms and dads, they all drowned in the flood. They all vanished. So there are six reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture here, and I'm going to give you nine total, but not one time is the church mentioned in the Bible dis discussion from the book of Revelation chapter 4 verse 4 until Revelation 19, which I said covered seven years. In all the writings of Paul, the church is never mentioned in connection to the tribulation or the wrath to come. That's what the tribulation is all about. It's going to reveal the wrath of God. And since, since Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for your sin and my sin, we will not be part of of the judgment of the wrath of God because the wrath of God fell on Jesus Christ. And because we put our faith and trust in Christ, we'll be raptured out and we'll, we won't be part of the tribulation, all right? And the church has already been judged at Calvary. And why? Judgment. That's what the tribulation is. Judgment, right? And when you think about Enoch, uh, how that he was raptured out. Go back and read the book of, of Genesis. He was raptured out and he didn't even die. And so there are two witnesses that will be coming back. And then in the book of Revelation, they will be witnesses for God, but they will die. Okay. And so uh, one of those is Enoch. All right. And in Revelation chapter 19, that it pictures the church in heaven during the tribulation period. So the coming of Christ for his saints is always pictured as sudden and unexpected, but it's imminent, all right? So right now, God is still striving with rebellious uh, mankind, but those who deceive and those who have been deceived, uh, uh, the calling, the convicting, the convincing uh, of the saving sins, but, but he says, but there's coming a day very soon when God is going to say, the time is now. His patience will be given away and his grace 
that uh, through Jesus Christ right now that is so easily accepted and everything uh, is going to be given away to God's wrath. And in the book of tribulation, when you read about revelation uh, uh, and, and about the tribulation period in revelation, that once that, that tribulation starts, those who have never heard the gospel will have a chance to get saved, but they're going to have to give their life. <clears throat> their life will have to be taken from them. Unlike the, the period that we live today, where a person can get saved, have their name written in the Lamb's book of life and be prepared for all eternity. So, but the tribulation period, the judgment will be so terrible and so severe, it's even beyond our comprehension that God will not allow his church to even go through it. So, but 1 Thessalonians 1.10, write this down. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says that we as God's children are waiting for Christ's return and then we are not appointed unto wrath. The wrath is the tribulation period. We're not appointed unto that. The wrath for our sins has already been on Jesus Christ, all right? So there's a feeling in the air that the return of Christ is very, very soon. The urgency, I'm always trying to encourage people to go out and be a soul winner, win everybody you can as fast as you can because you don't know how much time they've got. But I do know the, the rapture's coming soon. So, so why do so many people feel this way? Certainly, the signs of the time are all around us. The nuclear threats of our day alone uh, have many thinking that we just cannot continue this way for long. But think of it this way. Many people in their lifetime have seen mankind harness the atom develop capabilities to destroy the entire earth. Are you ready for this? In less than 30 minutes. Israel established a nation and the, and the dispersed Jews returned to Israel by hundreds of thousands, just as the Bible predicted what, what would happen just before Christ returns. So Israel has become the hub, the hotbed of all that goes on in the world. The Jews re recapture the city of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years and a war that took only six days. These are events that you and I have witnessed in our lifetime. Computers have changed the world. It's linked us together with instant communication. The cashless society is nearly done. The deal heard, we hear more about earthquakes in our lifetime than the last 500 years put together. Technology events from airplanes to space shuttles to subterranean tunnels to AI. So if you are old enough to get a discount at a restaurant like me, then, then you, you've seen your lifetime that the divorce rate has gone from one to eight. You know, it's amazing. Uh, that 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 uh, the divorce rate is gone to, to the max. They outnumber marriages. Uh, crime rate has increased over 500 percent. Birth of a Church of Satan in 1969 by Anton Lavey, which is now granted tax exempt status, and we're seeing statues of all, all of the demonic uh, 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 statues you can imagine being, being put on even government places. So the U.S. government, one world government, began to be formed. The new world order, the one world church. The ecumenical uh, movement, unprecedented increase in famines and natural disasters, incurable diseases. There's an intensity, a building up, an expectancy in the air that something's about to happen big and, and for, for this world, big and bad. All right. But as believers, we don't need to run around with like a chicken with his head cut off and hysteria. We simply look up for our redemption draweth nigh. Jesus is our redemption and he draws close even nigh right now at the door. We are faithfully and patiently waiting for our Savior, who will soon come bursting through the blue with the sound of a trumpet in the twinkling of an eye. But the Bible says that that means in a millisecond, in an instant, 
Therefore, when the rapture occurs, if you're not saved, there will not be a time, there'll be a not enough time for you to get saved. It'll be too late. It'll be in an instant. I've had a lot of friends of mine in the last few years just walking down the the, the, the their hallway, just drop dead. I've had people that, that didn't think they were going to die, and all of a sudden they got an illness, and, and in a matter of time, they were dead. I mean, in an instant. So if you're a Christian, and you're not living for God, there'll be, there'll be no time to make it right. No time to earn your crown. I'm gonna talk to you about the crowns that you can have right now to take and throw at the feet of Jesus. But your salvation is secure. Uh, but you'll be ashamed though when Jesus Christ comes and you won't be able to ask him to wait so you can go back and make things right. So. Uh, if you say, wait, Lord, I want to win a soul for you. My brother, my father, my, my spouse, my kids, my friend and neighbor, my coworker. Listen, if you have not led them to Jesus Christ, it will be too late for them. Now, wait, Lord, I want to obey you. And I, I want to take, I want to give tithes. I want to take and read the Bible. I want to get rid of my bitterness. I want to have my heart changed towards someone. Uh, you know, I'm going to stop looking at porn right now and, and I'm going to turn it off and, and I'm going to take all the things that are wrong in my life and I'm going to stomp them out like you would a fire. But the message of the rapture is be ready. Be ready. Write that down. Do it now. For the Lord could come at any moment. You should be watching. I mean, when you close your eyes tonight and lay on your bed, the next moment you may not have a morning. It may be with the Lord, but if you're not saved, uh, if you go back and read Luke 16, 19 through 31, from the lips of Jesus Christ, hell exists. So, so uh, we look in verse two, let's pretend that the rapture just happened. It just happened and we're whisked away. What would happen? What would you see and what would you hear? Boom, there's a rapture. What's the first thing you're going to see based on verse two? Behold, a throne. Three things we see upon arrival in heaven. We see the master on the throne. Verse three, it says it's jasper and sword and stone, which means great in glory. And, and the word transparent jasper could mean like a diamond, the radiance of a diamond, beauty and, and infinite pure. Then there's the sword and stone. It's a deep red symbolizing the blood of Christ. Did you get that? That's what a sword and stone color is. And in the Old Testament, the high priest, they wore a breastplate. And on that breastplate were 12 stones representing the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel. But the first and the last stone in the breastplate were these two, Jasper and Sardin, okay? Not only in great glory, but in great peace. Now look at the end of verse three. There is a rainbow. After God destroyed the world with a flood, he made a covenant with man and put in the sky his symbol of that covenant, the rainbow, a picture of what? God's grace, God's grace. But most rainbows are multicolored, but this one is emerald green, the color of what? The earth. Now this is so important, all right? And as earth dwellers that we're going to be raptured away, we'll realize that once and for all, the storms of life are all over because of this promise of God in heaven. We're in heaven now if the rapture takes place and we're beholding the throne and we will realize that all of our storms are over. All of our trials are over. The life that we were connected to here is over. And, and yet you'll say it'll be worth it all when you actually look at the face of Jesus Christ. All of your life's trials will seem so small when we see Jesus Christ. It, our life is but a season, all right? One glimpse of Jesus Christ's dear face, all sorrow will be erased. So and, and, and so bravely have we run the race till we see Christ. So can you see him on the throne? Can, can you see the, him great in his glory, great in his grace? So then what about great in government? Verse five says, what a change. One moment we find that uh, uh, we're beholding the, the rainbow of peace. 
And the next, we see lightning and flashing and thundering and crashing. So though the storms are over for us, down below the storms are brewing like never before at God's righteous judgment goes forth on the earth from his mighty throne. Now remember I said if we were, the rapture took place and we're in heaven and we were to look down, that's what you would see. We're at peace, but the world is not. That, so you say, well, time out. Where, where will you be when the rapture comes? Well, will you be witnessing this scene before describing of heaven? Or will you be left behind in the storm which originates from his throne, his wrath against all of mankind and the earth? So there are only two choices. Either be raptured away by Jesus or be left behind by Jesus. And what will you do with Jesus now determines what you will do then. So we've seen the master on the throne. Great glory. We've seen his grace. We've seen his government. But now the multitude before the throne. It talks about that. Verse 4. Who are, the four, who are these elders? These elders represent the redeemed. Chapter 5 makes it clear. Verse 4 says they were clothed in white raiment. White raiment means righteousness of Christ. And then it mentions the crowns that we can win. I want you to write these crowns down. You say, well, you know, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Yeah, but listen, you, got, you, you need to have something to lay at the feet of Jesus. And he gives you these crowns to do that. You have what's called the runner's crown. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It's given to the Christian who exhibits self-control, temperate in all things. In other words, like Paul says, he brought his body into subjection. He didn't want to give in to those sins anymore. He wanted to repent of those sins. Well, that's what God says. He says, when you decide to change your life because of, of receiving Christ and because of the Holy Ghost that lives in you and, you, and you see in the Word of God that God has a standard and you decide to follow those standards in order to bring glory and honor to God, he's going to give you a runner's crown. Then number two, there's going to be the soul winner's crown. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is known as the crown of joy. And it gives to those who win souls to Christ. The Apostle Paul says, he says, you're my crown. He's talking about to those that, had, that he had won to Jesus Christ. He said, that's my reward. You are my reward when I get to heaven. So there's the runner's crown. There's the soul winner's crown. Then there's the crown of righteousness. And that is the uh, 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 a crown in 2 Th uh, Timothy chapter 4. It's given to the Christian who anticipates and, and faithfully waits and looks for the coming of Jesus Christ each and every day. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, come, come quickly, like the Bible says. But you're looking that this could be the day and the urgency to do what you need to do to bring glory and honor to him and to win people to Christ. Then there's the crown of life in James chapter 1. So we've got the runner's crown, the soul winner's crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life given to the Christian who endures the sufferings in a noble way. They've gone through the persecutions and the sufferings, but they faithfully wait and look for the coming of Jesus Christ. And then uh, we, and in, the, in the book of Hebrew, chapter 11, it talks about all those that were sent to the lion's den and all those that, that still believed in Jesus Christ and waited for Christ, you know, and, and yet they had to die. So, but once again, the sufferings, the crown of life. <clears throat> and then there's the crown of glory in 1 Peter chapter 5. This is the minister's crown given to a faithful shepherd. I didn't say a perfect shepherd, but a faithful uh, shepherd. Though they, these are the five crowns that we can win, and, and what will we do with them? We're not going to parade around heaven saying, look at me. No, we're, we're, we're going to uh, lay them down at the feet of Jesus Christ. Verse 10 and 11, Christians, will you have any crowns to cast at, the, at Jesus' feet? We've seen the master on the throne. 
the multitude before the throne and the majesty surrounding the throne in verses six through eight. Who are the four beasts at the foot of the throne? Now this gets exciting, guys. Remember I talked to you uh, a while ago at the beginning of the sermon that we have to go back to Genesis for this. But right now in verses six through eight, who are the four beasts at the foot of the crown? These four beasts represent all four of creation praising God. Now write that down. All four, who are the four beasts? All four of the creation of God. In Genesis chapter 9, God destroyed the earth with a flood and he saved Noah and the family and he made a covenant with four specific categories of creation. Now watch this. And verse 8, it says, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, and I behold, establish my what? My covenant with you and with your seed after you. Now watch this. And with every living creature that is with you of the fowl, the cattle, and the beasts of the earth. So write this down. He's, a, he's making a new covenant with man, a new covenant with the fowl, a new covenant with the cattle, and a new covenant with the beast of the earth. So with that in mind, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 7, it says, And the first beast was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So we got the lion, that's the beast of the earth. We got the calf, which is the cattle. We've got man, which is man, and the eagle, which is the fowl. So God has made a covenant not only with man, but all of his creation. So don't ever get the idea that God is finished with his creation. Don't ever get the idea that the devil spoiled it and it's all over for all of his creation. It's not true. Not only did God redeem man, but also his creation will be ultimately redeemed at the end. The Bible says if we don't praise the Lord, listen, even the rocks would cry out to give glory and honor to God. In Romans chapter 8, let's read this. In verses uh, 19 through 22, it describes the groaning of this redemption when all the creation will bloom like a rose. All right, let's read it. Romans chapter 8, verse 19 through 22. As we begin to kind of close this down, he says in verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because, here it is, the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, now we just defined all four, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain, until now. So now then we see now who the four elders were that were bind before. It represented all of creation. And later in Revelation, we see the lion and the lamb laying down together. And the little toddler will play with the, uh, by the hole of the snake and together all creation will be at peace and will praise God and together and they'll praise their creator. So we find here, uh, look at what the 24 elders say when they, when they see the four beasts praising God. Verse 11, the world was created by Jesus for Jesus, sustained through Jesus, redeemed by Jesus, and it's all coming back to Jesus. Can I get a hallelujah out of that? So we've described what we see here. But what will it be like? For one thing, there will be singing. Verse 11, thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. There's another sound we'll hear in, chapter, in this chapter in verse 8. Let's imagine the sound of all of creation, all of it. Not just man, but all of it. Not just the angels, right? But all of mankind. And we got the beast, we got the fowl and all that. He, they'll be chanting, holy, 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 continuously as it attempts an unceasing to describe how holy God is. You know, when the seraphim circle God, every time they circle God, they, they scream out, holy, 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 because God is indefinite. I mean, he goes on and on and on. So after millions or even billions or trillions or quadrillions of, of what you and I would call years, 
or time, we find that every time they circle God's throne, they see something new in God that they've never seen before because God is never ending in showing his glory. So what will happen to you at the rapture? You'll Listen, the question is, will you be right with God through Jesus Christ right now? Or will you take the chance of being left behind, uh, prepared for the storm that will one day end your life and begin eternal separation from God in hell? So what do you see in Jesus Christ right now will determine what Jesus will will do. The The question is, are you rapture ready? Are you death ready? So... We find here that, that there are nine proofs. Now, this I want you to stay with me because I'm going to go really fast with this right here. But there are nine proofs of the pre-trib rapture. And it begins in Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 through 44. And the Lord is teaching about the pre-trib. There are nine proofs. Now, jot this down. So we find here in Matthew, first of all, the Lord gives many signs for the event described in Matthew chapter 24. This is your study after we finish our sermon day. Write it down. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 31. Thus, you can know when the event is happening, but the rapture will be, which is imminent, it is a sign uh, 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 or a signless event. You'll have no sign to prepare. Oh, Jesus is coming at 12 midnight. No, you don't know. Nobody knows, all right? So of that day and hour, no one knows. Matthew 24, verse 36. You see, he must be referring to the rapture, not the second coming at the end of the tribulation, because you can see that coming because you can measure the tribulation in seven years. But in the rapture, there is no measurement. So secondly, the word now concerning, which is peri D. Start, start verse 36, has indicated that this new idea is now being discussed. And then thirdly, the words that day and hour in verse 36 refers to the start of the day of the Lord, which is the rapture. The day of the Lord is the rapture. And that day and hour is distinguished from references to those days, which is plural in the prior section of Matthew chapter 24, verse 19 22 and 29. And so the the fourth pre-trib is the Lord's reference to the days of Noah in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39. Now I'm just giving you scriptures to go back and read because we don't have the time on Facebook to read every scripture on this thing. But these are the nine proofs of the pre-trib, all right? But it does not fit with someone being in a period of seven years which is the uh, identifiable signs because there will be, you know, uh, the pouring out of God's wrath. And, and we talk about the bold judgments and all of that. You can see that happening and say, well, we're getting close to the end. And then you'll see uh, the great battle of Armageddon. And then there'll be the second coming of Jesus Christ. But the rapture is not like that. There is no sign at the midnight hour cry. In fact, in the tribulation, uh, and halfway through, you'll have the abomination of desolation. That's when uh, uh, you know the Antichrist sets himself up in the very throne that where Israel's worshiping and says, "I'm God. You're going to worship me." So he desecrates, or, or well, that's why it's called the abomination of desolation. So there's a measurement of time. But in the rapture, there is no measurement of time. The things before the flood were business as usual uh, uh, as Noah's day, and they will be business as usual at the time of the rapture as well. Then fifth, a comparison between Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 through 44, and Paul's words, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, shows that the pre-trib rapture is in view of Matthew 24. So Paul picks up the Lord's thief in the night imaginary theory and refers to the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. Did you get that? The thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. The day of the Lord, all right? So Paul indicates that people will be saying peace and, and safety in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. But when the day of the Lord starts, 
There'll be sudden destruction. It will, it will come upon them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. They will not escape the time of wrath. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. Sorry about that. I had my phone turned on. All right. So Paul indicates that people will be saying peace and safety. And then the day of the Lord will start. And this sudden destruction will come upon them. And the tribulation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's read it. Verses 9 through 10. For God has not appointed us. Talking about the saved. To wrath. Did you get that? The wrath is the tribulation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died. Can you, can you turn that off for me? Thank you. And uh, I, I always try to turn my phone off, but, you know, we're getting down toward the end, and, boy, interruptions are coming. All right. So here we go, right? So once again, let's pick back up. The, people will not escape the time of wrath, which is what? When the rapture takes place, immediately the tribulation period starts, and it will go for seven years, all right? And so, for God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we shall, listen to this, live together with him. Aren't you excited about that? Then the number six, Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. In 2 Peter 3, 10, they show the pre-trib rapture that was talked about in Matthew 24. In 1 Peter 3, verse 20 through 21, Peter talks about the time of Noah and the family being saved from the wrath of the flood via the ark. And the ark was the picture of Jesus Christ. So that salvation was not regeneration, but a type of a rapture in a church. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, I know I'm giving you a lot of information here, but Peter uses the Lord's image of the thief in the night to refer to the soon imminent unexpected return of Jesus Christ, which will culminate in the destruction of the current heavens and the earth and the creation of um, mainly of a new heaven and a new earth, which we don't have time to get into today. Number seven, I'm talking about the, the nine points, right, of the pre-trib. So the refer to one will be taken, underlying that, naturally fits with the pre-trib tribulation. And it, in, in the book of Revelation, it doesn't talk about anybody being taken to be with the Lord because the church is not mentioned in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4 through chapter 19. That's the tribulation. But before the tribulation, it talks about people being taken. So, and those that are left behind. You remember the Tim LaHaye books by the, that title, Left Behind? Naturally referred to the unbelievers who are not delivered, but must go through the tribulation. If one be taken, is taken away from judgment is particular that a word characterized by a person accompanied as an employee while uh, they're out working in the field. One will be taken, one will be left behind. One will be at, at the grinding of corn and one will be take, taken and the other left behind. And so the language most naturally suggests that one's taken refers to those taken in the rapture. Nothing in the second coming of Christ talks about anybody being taken. But here in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, it talks about and gives an example that the door is open. Jesus is the door, Revelation 3.20. And there was a call, the trumpet of God. And then he went up in the spirit and then the door closed. And then he showed him what was going to happen for the next seven years. And then number eight, the imagery of a thief in the night fits perfectly perfectly with the pre-trib rapture, but it does not fit at all for those who have been left behind who go through the tribulation. So once the man of sin signs a covenant with Israel, anyone who reads the Bible can see that day uh, that there'll be, that once he signs that covenant, the beginning of, of 2,520 days has begun. When the two witnesses are killed, there will be 1,260 days before the coming of Jesus Christ. See, you can expect 
the second coming because you, you see a timeline here. So Jesus' second coming will not be like the thief in the night for anyone who has read the word of God can see that clearly, all right? But there, in fact, there can be no forewarning of the rapture if, if we are to honor the surprise element a uh, 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 resident in a thief analogy in, ch in chapter 24, verse 43, a thief, listen, the analogy of the thief, a thief does not willingly signal his presence. Hey, I'm here to rob you. Hey, I'm coming in the back door. A thief doesn't do that. But you know, but in the second coming of Jesus Christ, there's all these things that God says you can watch for and know that he's coming back uh, in the rapture. In fact, the battle of Armageddon will be the beginning and that moment and once it starts, that Christ will come back and we will come back with him. How can we come back with him unless we're already with him? That's why the rapture takes place. And then the night, as we close this out, the exhortation to watch. Gregorio, it says, absolutely shows that the pre-trib tribulation uh, is in view in both Matthew chapter 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. If pre-tribulationists agree that 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uses Gregoria, G-R-E-G-O-R-E-O, -E -E to in instruct believers of the New Testament church to stay alert, for the coming of the pre-tribulation rapture, then isn't it logical that Jesus could have utilized the same word in the same way at the Olivet Discourse? Why? Matthew chapter 7, we close this out. This is our last verses. Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Remember, he says, I never knew you. Listen, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And we know that the will of the Father was to take and, and, and have his son go to the cross, die for our sins, shed his blood, be resurrected, and then for us to call and believe on his son to save us. So once again, that was God's purpose of trying to uh, go th to, to let us know what God's going to go through in order to save mankind. And mankind has a choice to put their faith and trust in Jesus. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name? And then Jesus says, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, uh, he says, who have practiced lawlessness, right? So once again, we see here uh, uh, that the word of God teaches us that, that, that unless, unless you've trusted in Jesus, it's not about serving God. It's not about going out and casting out demons. It's not about prophesying. And all. Hey, have you put your faith and trust in and only in Jesus Christ, like the thief on the cross, uh, he, he didn't put his trust in anybody but Jesus Christ. And he said, I've sinned. And so he, he repented to the Father in a sense by saying, well, I, all these things I've done, they were wrong. They were wrong. I did wrong. You see that? So when you get saved, repentance is repenting to the Father and seeing God for who he is. You're the creator. You're holy. And I have sinned against you. I am unfit to be in your presence. But then we see that God gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the thief on the cross looked to Jesus and said, Would you remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom? And salvation happened instantly. Christ said, Today thou wilt be with me in paradise. You see, that's the process. And yet here we live in the day of grace. So after we're saved, God sends his Holy Spirit, that's Christ in spiritual form, into our lives. And if we will listen to the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to bring glory and honor to God, and as we allow God to change us, yes, there'll come a time after salvation that we're going to want to repent of our sins because we don't want to take it and, and dishonor God. We want to honor God. So that's where life-changing experiences come after salvation, 
not before. Because if I had to repent of sins before getting saved, then there goes, uh, you have to understand, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest he mention both. So this is not about me trying to get, you know, uh, physically prepared to meet God. No, I am. it's about a spiritual. Lord, I've sinned against you. You are holy. You're my creator. I need a savior. That's Jesus, the Christ, Emmanuel, the God with us. And so I'm trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. He, t he died for my sins, shed his blood, and on the third day arose, and he's alive forevermore. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. It's a simple, just trusting in Jesus Christ. All right? Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be, could be. Hey, well, listen, why not trust in Jesus today? Why not ask the Holy Spirit to convict your heart that you know that you're a sinner before a holy God? And then let the Holy Spirit convict your heart. That, that That's what the Holy Spirit's job is. He's to go. That's why we're to be a witness with the Holy Spirit, to go out by, under the power of the Holy Spirit in order to, to present Christ in such a way that the Holy Spirit can help that person know that they are inferior to being in the presence of a holy God. And then to look to a Savior known as Jesus the Christ, who died for them, rose for them, was alive for them, and wants to save them. Go back and read the last book of Revelation. And, 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 and you'll see the calling of the bride of the church. You'll see the calling of Jesus Christ. Come. He just uses one word, C-O-M-E. Come. Come. Let him that thirst. Come. It's an invitation for you to make that decision once and for all so you can K-N-O-W. And you know, I love 1 John 5, 13, that you can know that you have everlasting life. You say, preacher, how do I do that? It's simple. I've already explained it. The Bible explained it. Do you see yourself as a sinner before a creator, a holy creator? Do you realize that you're not going to get into heaven without Jesus? Go back and listen to our sermon last week. We'll talk about the tabernacle and what the three curtains represent, the way, the truth, and the life. And in the inner sanctuary is where God was. And that's where the 10 by 10 room and the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat of God. But to get in, you had to go through the way, the truth, and the life, the three curtains that were in the tabernacle. And Jesus says, I am, that's God. I am. God is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can enter into that uh, 10 by 10 room without having the blood that was sacrificed at the front brought in and carried in. It's because of the blood that they were able to go in and sprinkle the blood all over the mercy seat and everything else in the presence of God. And so once again, please understand that you're not going to get to heaven uh, by try trying to make up a God. You're going to get to heaven because of the only God God the Father, who is also God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They created this world. It was their standard, and it's God's will that you put your faith and trust only in Jesus Christ to save you. And you can do that by calling on his name right now. I hope and pray those that are listening today will not only like this, but they'll share it to their page because my page only reaches so many people. But every time you share it and your friends share it, and it goes on, we can reach thousands with just one message. Oh, Father, I pray you bless those that are listening. I pray that, Lord, that your spirit would inspire them to start getting ready, to start getting their mind ready, their life ready, and start looking that you're going to come at any hour, any second. And, Father, even if you don't come for another hundred years, Lord, we're not going to live to be that long. So, Lord, we could. this could be our last day on this earth. And we need to get our lives straightened out right now. And, and Lord, that we might be able to obtain those crowns that you promised us, that we could lay at your feet to give you glory and honor and praise. So Father, help us today to not only become a Christian, but Lord, to live like one and to witness like one. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, go to our website at lyitl.org. That's lovingthelord.org. And uh, hey, share this ministry. That's It's a ministry website. And if God lays on your heart, we're like everyone else. Uh, you know, if you want to take and, and plant a seed in this ministry, that would be a blessing. But until then, prayer. Please pray for us as we want to pray for you and just pray that, that God will inspire people to become witnesses and soul winners for Jesus Christ before it's too late. The rapture's coming and it'll be unexpected. 
but it's going to happen. God bless you all. We love you in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, amen.